Hello and welcome to Varm Blog. This is in some ways a response to criticism and a response to making what I'm saying much more clear. I don't know how much clearer I can make it sometimes, but maybe it is time to make it. I've been accused of being too soft on um, the Democrats for letting Democratic adjacent people come on my show and not hard pushing back, even though I'm not endorsing them. I've been accused of uh, being too soft on nationalism, usually Palestinian nationalism, but sometimes even Israeli nationalism for saying things like uh, it would be a miracle if some war crimes were not committed in uh, October 7th of last year, even if most of them were totally made up by the IDF. Um, that these kinds of atrocity exhibitions largely are beside the point and expecting anyone in any situation to 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 be that self-control once the levees break loose giving the conditions at hand seems a little bit unbelievable but i'm going to start off with a quote from marx It is certainly, it is an interesting event that we are dealing with, the putrescence of the absolute spirit. When the last spark of his life had failed, various components of this kaput mortuum began to decompose, entered into new combinations and formed new substances. The industrialists of philosophy who then had lived on the exploitation of the absolute spirit now seized upon the new components. Each with all possible zeal, set about retailing his apported share. This naturally gave rise to competition, which to start with was carried in a moderately staid bourgeois fashion. Later, when the German market was glutted, the commodity, in spite of all efforts, found no response in the world market. The business was spoiled in the usual German manner by fabricated and fictitious production, deteriorating in quality, adulteration of raw materials, falsification of labels, fictitious purposes, bill jobbing and credit systems devoid of any real basis the competition turned into bitter struggle which now being extolled and interpreted to us as a revolution of world significance the begetter of the most prodigious results and achievements marx the german ideology i mean what marx is commenting on here is the degradation of german idealism into a kind of way repurposed for various ways of getting patronage, be they bourgeois or state bourgeois. And I think we are seeing that in radicalism today in a whole lot of ways. It, it, everything is rotted and people who are even critiquing the tailism on the Democrats, et cetera, uh, are not positing anything substantive to replace it. And in lieu of just admitting that they could not know everything that is needed to substantively replace it, to substantively replace it, sit down and posit that tailing the right or this and the other will help us out. Or if we critique Gaza more, or talk about how Hamas is wrong, et cetera, somehow we will get around the fundamental contradiction of the, of the apparent situation. And then we can quibble about whether or not something is technically under the results of the international criminal court uh genocide or not as if that was a meaningful thing to do from the standpoint of a chair that you're being filmed on somewhere in your office in portland or chicago or new york or california The message of this show for the past three years has been you have to deal with the situation as it exists right now. No ideological type, no invariant program, no fidelities of some abstraction will get around that for you. And most of that is either nostalgia or a coping mechanism. That the problems of capitalism both follow predictable patterns from the development of capital and increased organic compositional needs, meaning you need more power, more 
human resources, et cetera, while also pushing against that and automation, needing more power, but at behest of workers, et cetera. And the radical centralization of work ended up reversing on itself almost dialectically into a radical decentralization of work, where the centralization is hidden in technology and no longer in the organic composition of people, which is why many old cities are now, they were once part of the core of development, see the industrial Midwest, start falling away and becoming less important, and even attempts to re- uh, industrialize cannot address the difference in population and the difference in needs. And there are some fundamental problems that have emerged that are larger than just the need to socialize things. We can socialize Medicare and socialize education and provide free college, but if you have shit stuff you're working with, it's going to take you 10 to 15 to 20 years and basically an entire generation to reset things. How quickly can you train enough new doctors, even if you socialize medicine, to have enough to make a viable system? How quickly could you deal with the fact that there's so much human resources dumped into just administration and both medical and education that we would really need to get rid of? How do you deal with the exploitation built into professors with one-one teaching loads while their undergrads are being taught by adjuncts, you know, in the extreme? The people who have the, the most benefit in this situation also have the most power over it. So do you expect them to fix things? No. And the quick fixes often presented by democratic socialists or even quote, revolutionary socialists do not deal with the fundamental problems of the situation because they are larger than they were historically. If you continue to just think we need to push developmental forces forever and yet not deal with the contradictions these developmental forces engender, then I don't know how you ever really get anywhere other than picking one side of the status quo or another to support. And my my fundamental proposition has been that this period of time where that was a viable strategy is long over. This brings me to the question at hand, and I'm going to share it here for you. This is what sent to me in a forum. I'm going to keep it private, but this is what was said. I've been really enjoying the vlogs lately. It feels like a theme is positioning itself on. I feel like the theme is positioning itself on the following. A, elite and the institutions that they govern repre uh, and represent are incapable of addressing the complex crisis is unfolding. No adults in the room. The crises are global and perceived through the old land, i.e. nation states, nationalism, and autarkic economies. That means we cannot rely on executive powers at the federal and national level to jump in and save us or address anything in a way that is proactive or future-proofed. I wouldn't say anything. There's just a lot less. No Bonapartism. Nope, that's going to accelerate the problem. Uh, that acceleration does not automatically lead to uh, socialism any more than immiseration does. It cuts in many different directions, and you have to address it specifically. Just hoping to induce the crisis doesn't solve it. No protesting for change, that's, act, that's an act of dependency. And while it makes your thing known, it should be very clear that speaking truth to power is actually kind of foolish, that you assume the problem is ignorance and not just blind, callous power mongering. No tailism, nope, that's not gonna help you anymore. Actually, what you tend to do when you tail is to save dying parties. We've seen that with the, pop, the populist right saving the Republicans. And to a lesser degree, the social democratic slash democratic socialist slash progressive left saving the center of the Democratic Party only for it to really fuck up in the last two years. C. That means for all intents and purposes, we are organizing not for today, but for centuries in the future. I wouldn't say centuries, but I would say you're not organizing for today. You're organizing for generations in the future. 
one message being in the face of complex collapse, which is what we are barreling towards, not a southern apocalyptic one, although that is still possible with nuclear weapons, but a progression towards date breakdown asterisk is more likely. We have to figure out what organizing looks like. Yes. Particularly what skills and knowledge can be passed down in the face of systems collapse, i.e. what sorts of things can survive a major technological drop is what to happen. See the Cagnable to Leibniz references. Yeah, I mean, I think, for example, there's more and more dependence on technologies that need more and more resources to operate that do not pay out a huge amount for the resources needed, see AI and power usage, um, which will overtax the systems. And the idea that developmental forces just keep on going unilaterally and don't ever decline is just false. The need to be disciplined, think and act with purpose and clarity, the need to be motivated and put in work where needed without distraction, essentially developing practice, moral uh, virtues and morals that we would push towards the foreseeable future and outside of what is considered the current political discourse. Making making the praxis, yeah, that's what we're gotta be aiming at here is making the praxis itself, but putting the praxis in both the context of the theory, of why we are doing the praxis and the poesis, what we're actually making, not just what we're doing. We don't need just the Moses Hess breakdown of a practice and um, of theory, of ignoring that poesis is already there. So maybe this is a question for the Q&A, but it sounds like a theme that are leading us down a path of formulating those practices and virtues organizing around them. Yes, we are. This is why things like my support of Palestinian liberation is also couched in real fears that all concepts of indigeneity are going to be put to the test when there are great movements of peoples as ecosystems fundamentally change and as population imbalances by age become more and more pronounced this will probably lead to people doubling down on the kind of nationalism that doesn't work at the very moment when that nationalism really can't work but it is the most attractive because it seems stable this brings me back to older patterns of existence. Before we even get to Marx's critique of capitalism, people like Polybius arguing about the degradation of democracies into oligarchies and oligarchies into tyrannies as systems that become overly complex. This is my tainter reading of the Polybius argument. I don't have the same spiritual undergirding that attempts to simplify the system tends to invest in other powers uh, into singular individuals who can demagogically kind of make up for the elites. But this kind of populism is a way of managing decline, often sapping the skills and de-skilling even the elites to manage their own situation. And we see this today in the fact that increasingly administrators can't imagine having the expertise in-house that they're going to outsource everything forever, even though it increases even their own expense. That is a product of de-skilling that is in and of itself a product of increasingly protected oligarchies. What side of the political equation in the United States that you sit on is picking a different balance in those oligarchies, and that's pretty much it. Nor can you just throw one leader at it to fix the problem. And the historical examples that people use for that being efficacious all actually prove the opposite, as almost every one of them go into crisis the immediately after the primary leader dies. This ignores that no leader can hold everything together as a single individual. And you would think that people who believe in the systemic movement of peoples would see that. But no. It substitutes for a psychological need that is a need for comfort. And this psychological need, if anything, is where I start worrying about democracy or not.
So someone asked me, having finished off Tainter, I thought it was an interesting and key point that you haven't emphasized as much, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on interstate competition delay and collapse. In the past, interstate competition does delay collapse or because it gets people to invest more in, in regime and in very inefficient regime dominance. And we see this today. That is why more and more uh, inter-country hostility is promoted by neoliberals is because that is a distraction from their own failures to run their own societies. That's almost universal, by the way. Diminishing returns on investments make it structurally impossible to completely manage a crisis as a mysterious constraint on our ruling class versus decadent theory. Um, it seems like we are in an unprecedented moment of global interstate competition. And if that makes collapse an all or nothing proposition, it might actually, because one of the things is that, and Tainter actually says this in speeches later. Um, I don't know if it so much comes up in the in the in the rise and collapse, but as the speeches about it ten years ago, he actually makes clear that global industrial society, what Marxists will call capitalism, is a singular system. It is in many ways an a divided and uneven totality in the way Marxists would describe it. Um, And that attempts to parse it out, you know, individual areas are somehow getting able to get around that entire interstate system ignores the fact of how interdependent all these states are on each other's productive capacities. Um, we do not know if that means this system will be more resilient to major shocks or less because it is in some ways historically unprecedented. Even moving from a system of unipolarity to multipolarity, but still within the same large economic interglobal interly connected framework, even if certain parties have finally been able to develop some of their own internal frameworks due to fractures in that interglobal system, we have to act or intra global system, excuse me. We have to actually really think about where this is all going and what it all means. There is not a clear way for me to say which way this is going to play out, but you can see as FEMA seems to be out of money during hurricane season, et cetera, even though there's no real reason why it has to be that we are reaching a point where this capacity is not there. So if you want to take over such an empty state or play games with it, trying to believe that if you can play partisan politics against each other in some crucial way, this will give you a way out. You are still limiting yourself to one node in that system. And almost everyone does that because viewing it globally is overwhelming. Just pick your, your poison on how you get out of it as if that's going to fix it for you. Now, to those who say that I'm too soft on Democrats because of things like wanting to end the Gaza war, being sympathetic to the reasons why the Black Lives Matter protests happen, et cetera, but also immediately pointing out that all these movements were recuperable, Palestine's harder to be recuperable because there is a bipartisan consensus on it. So what most of the political parties want to do is to shut you to hell up. Whereas BLM was recoupable by one side and not another due to their internal rhetoric. All of which has backfired, by the way, but that didn't mean it wasn't understandable as why it happened and avoiding looking at how it happened and how it went that way by just unilaterally condemning it or praising it totally misses the developmental point and always will. And if you think I'm talking to you, it's because I am. Anyway. Take care. Keep your peace. Like and subscribe if you want more of this.